Michael B. Riley of Heilbronn, Germany. James G. Johnston of Trumansburg, New York. Elliot J. Robbins of Ogden, Utah. James G. Sartor of Teague, Texas. William Fries of Parkersburg, West Virginia. Michael Isaiah Nance of Chicago, Illinois. Brandon Day Krischer of Stryker, Ohio. Slayton Richard Saldana of Mount Manassas, Virginia. Scott A. Copenhafer of Mancos, Colorado. Clayton James Horn of Atlanta, Louisiana. Jose J. Gonzalez of La Puente, California. Luis F. De Leon Figueroa of Chicopee, Massachusetts. Dustin Ard of Hyde Park, Utah. Ellis A. Barreto Ortiz of Morovis, Puerto Rico. Jeremy W. Griffin of Greenbrier, Tennessee. Nathan G. Irish of Billings, Montana. David Nadel of Tarrant, Texas. Kirk Fuchigama Jr. of Keanu, Hawaii. Michael J. Goble of Westwood, New Jersey. Henry Mayfield Jr. of Hazelcrest, Illinois. Miguel A. Villayon of Joliet, Illinois. Ian P. McLaughlin of Newport News, Virginia. Antonio Moore of Wilmington, North Carolina. Paul K. Voss of Yigo, Guam. Ryan S. Faneuf of Hudson, New Hampshire. Antonio R. Rodriguez of Las Cruces, New Mexico. Javier J. Gutierrez of Jacksonville, North Carolina. Brandon Time Kimball of Central Point, Oregon. Walter Lewark of Mountain Air, New Mexico. Diego DiPongo of Simi Valley, California. Moises A. Navas of Germantown, Maryland. Marshall D. Roberts of Owasso, Oklahoma. Juan Mendez Covarrubias of ha Hanford, California. John David Randolph Hilty of Bowie, Maryland, and Christopher Wesley Curry of Terre Haute, Indiana. These are the 35 people who died in the past year while serving in the military and conflict zones in our military. They are the newest ones that we honor tomorrow on Memorial Day. We know that these 35 are only a small number of those who suffer and die from war in our world. And we know that war leaves lasting scars on our service members and our communities. And the poet reminds us, and once more, let our hearts be broken. God have mercy on them for their heroic gift. May we live the good lives they would have lived. So may they in their dying and we in our living be instruments of a just and lasting peace. Come, let us gather together. Come, let us remember together. Come, let us grieve together. Come, let us worship together. Welcome all. Welcome to those from People's Church, to our friends from Birmingham Unitarian Church and Community Unitarian Universalists in Brighton, and to any and all visitors with us today. Welcome to our seekers and questioners, our nurturers and those who need to be nurtured, our explorers and activists, our comforters and those who seek comfort. We are a welcoming community, regardless of age, gender, sexual orientation, color or race. We welcome you. My name is Laura McClellan, and I'm from the Sunday Services Committee at People's Church. People's Church is a member congregation of the United Unitarian Universalist Association and part of a tradition of liberal religion. Here, our mission is to be a beloved community, embracing and serving our diverse world. Patricia Sheldon writes, the flames of life and love are never fully extinguished. 
In today's service, we will remember the lives and loves that live on in our memories and in our hearts. Welcome. Good morning from me as well. Uh, we're gonna be singing together a handful of times today and each time I would like to invite you to find a position for which that is comfortable or just hang out. We're gonna open with uh, Filled with Loving Kindness. That's number 1031. May I be filled with loving kindness. May I be well. May I be filled with loving kindness. May I be well, may I be peaceful and at ease, may I be whole, may you be filled with loving kindness, may you kindness. May you be well. May you be peaceful and at ease. May you be whole. May we be filled with loving kindness. May we be well, may we be filled with loving kindness. May we be well, may we be peaceful and at ease. May we be whole. I have several announcements to offer. The first is from BUC, but is an invitation to all of us gathered. BUC is offering a support group for those who need a safe place to discuss and express their feelings and learn about the grief many of us are experiencing during this difficult time. The support group meets every other Tuesday from 5 to 6 p.m. on Zoom, and the next meeting will be on this coming Tuesday, May 26th. The group is led by BUC Pastoral Care Associate Cindy Goldman and Pastoral Care Chair Jennifer Norber. The Zoom link is on BUC's website. It sounds like an especially important offering in these days. Now an announcement just for the members of People's Church. As you probably know, we, we are in the midst of, a, of our annual meeting, so we had our, in, our virtual in-person meeting last week, and it is voting time right now. So if you requested a, a mailed ballot, those went out in the mail on Monday. So if you have not received one, please be in contact with the church office so we can try to track that down. Uh, those of you who are voting online, please continue to do that. If you, if you did not get the link, again, be in contact with the church office. We've had a lot of participation already, which is wonderful and we need everyone to vote who chooses to vote by June 1st. And now I pass the mic to Julie, Reverend Julie, for some announcements for her congregation. Hi everyone, it is such a pleasure to be here this morning with Reverend Rachel. She always puts on a beautiful and delightful service for all of us and I can't wait to experience it with all of you. 
Some information about Cubs annual meeting and the information that you might need for Cubs annual meeting. Today, we will actually be having an informational session at 1 p.m. And this is gonna be happening back over at our Zoom link. I will have it on the website um, shortly after the end of this service. It's also all of the regular service Zoom links that you have been going to every Sunday. I realize it's not up now because we have Kalamazoo Zoom link up right now. Um, and it was also in the special Cub News that was sent out this weekend. So you can find it there. The annual meeting is going to be in person on, or on Zoom, <laughs> in person, uh, on June 7th. And we all hope that you can make it. If you need an absentee ballot, please contact Diane Morgan, our church secretary. You can get her at DS. M O R G A N six zero five two at iCloud or by emailing board at cub.org. She will get it there too and respond. Absentee ballots are due by noon, the day of the meeting. If you don't show up the day of the meeting or send in an absentee ballot, we will not be able to collect your vote. So it's very important that you show up the day of the meeting or send in an absentee ballot. Of course, if you have any questions about the annual meeting whatsoever, show up today at one or email board at cub.org. Thank you so much. This morning's chalice lighting comes from David Breeden. Um, as a reminder, if you are lighting a chalice at home, you are welcome to type in the chat box, a chalice is lit in and wherever you are. Here's my chalice. There's my chalice. In this time of loss, in this time of asking why, we light a flame of sharing. We light a flame of commitment. In this time of why, we light this flame, sign of our searching, sign of our sharing, sign that together we remember, together we ask why, together in sadness and joy we share light, together we celebrate what we are together. While we're checking in with our chalice lightings, we're going to sing number 159. This is my song. This is my song, O God of all the nations, a song of peace for lands afar and mine. This is my heart. The country where my heart is, here are my hopes, my dreams, my holy shrine. But other hearts in other lands are beating with hopes and dreams as true and high as mine. My country skies are bluer than the ocean, and sunlight beams on clover, leaf, and pine. But other lands have sunlight too, and clover, and skies are everywhere as blue as mine. Oh, hear my song, thou God of all the nations, a song of peace for their land and for mine. Isa Gautami was still a young woman when she was married 
to a family who is not thrilled to have her join the family. In fact, there are some who say she was scorned by her new family. That was until she gave birth to a healthy baby boy. And then she had a place of honor in her family. She loved her son so much, she carried him with her everywhere with great joy. Shortly after he learned how to walk, her son grew very ill and he died. He Sagotomi was struck with so much grief and anguish at the loss of her son that she couldn't accept it. She wandered around the village, holding him close to her body, asking everyone for just the right medicine to bring him back to life. All of the villagers could see that she was mad with her grief and they knew they couldn't bring the right medicine to bring her baby back to life. Finally, there was a kind and wise man who suggested that she go and speak to the Buddha, the enlightened one, and maybe he could help her. So with some hope in her heart, she went over to the next village where the Buddha was teaching. And she said, please, please help me. Help me with the right medicine to bring my baby back to life. And though the Buddha could see that there was no life left in this child, he said, I can help you, but you must need you first, you need to do something for me. You need to go through the village and collect mustard seeds, but these seeds must come from a household where no one has died. With great hope in her heart, she carried her son and she went from door to door in the village and she said, may I please have a handful of mustard seeds? And people were like, sure, sure, we have mustard seeds for you. And she says, oh, wait, they can only be, has anyone died in your household recently? Ah, uh, yes, our grandfather recently died. Oh, she said, these mustard seeds won't work. So she went to the next house. They too had mustard seeds to spare, but when she asked if anyone had died in their household, they shared that there was a young daughter who had been killed in an accident. She knew she had to keep looking. She went through the village and behold, all of the doors on which she knocked throughout the village, People had lost aunts and uncles, beloved grandparents. There was not a house in the village where no one had died. Finally, she realized she was not alone in her loss and her grief. And though she still desperately missed her son, she realized that death was inevitable and a natural part of life. Though still grieving, she was able to go into the forest and bury her son. And then she returned to the Buddha. She saw the wisdom that he brought to her and she became a devoted follower of him for the rest of her life. People's people are generous people. And that takes many forms, but this week it takes the form of solar panels. Because this week we had solar panels installed on the roof of our church building. They're not connected yet, but soon they will be producing about 40% of the electricity that that building consumes when it's occupied, probably more when it's sitting largely empty. And this has been a long project. It has involved members of the Green Sanctuary Committee and our Net Zero Task Force and the Board of Trustees. It's involved a partnership with Helios Solar that involves 
tax credits and depreciation and all kinds of words that they don't really teach you about in seminary, but luckily other people in our church understand the nuances of contracts and all of that. It involved a partnership with Westminster Presbyterian Church who did this before us and gave us some good advice about how to navigate and had one of their members who's a lawyer look over the contract and make sure it made sense. So I am so grateful to all of the people who have made this happen. And we know the work continues. We know that in this time of, of distancing, there are still ways we can live our values. And so I am so grateful to all of you and all of the ways we are being faithful in this time. So this is the time where I ask you to continue to support the good and important work of our congregation with your money. The link to giving will appear shortly in our chat box. That's for online giving. We are still picking up our mail. So if you wanna send us a check, we will gladly receive that. Thank you all for being generous in all of the ways you are generous to support the good and important work of our congregations. The offertory this morning is from our teal hymnal. It's number 1006, In My Quiet Sorrow by Jeannie Gagney. Please join in giving thanks for all that sustains us. From the countless gifts we each have been given, gifts of life and love and sustenance, we bring these small portions to share in the works of love, which none of us can accomplish alone. Our congregations, our circles of support, support in hard times, in good times, in the in-between times, congregations that grieve alongside us and celebrate our milestones. And one of the ways we do that is during our services. So it is our practice for joys and sorrows to invite people who wish to participate, to chat, to write it in the chat box. And it would be helpful for me if it's not obvious from your, from your screen name what your name is, if you write your name so I can attribute things correctly. So I invite you to, to begin to share and I will read them aloud. And this, I also pause recording during this point of the service. So we're just sharing within the circle of 216 devices rather than the whole internet because we post these later on YouTube. our meditation time today, I invite each of you to take a deep breath with me to begin. You may wish to place your hand on your belly to ensure that you're taking deep belly breaths. Does your abdomen rise and fall with your breath? Are you centered in your body? 
I invite you to just take some deep breaths while I share these words from Thich Nhat Hanh. Breathing in, I know I am breathing in. And breathing out, I know I am breathing out. Breathing in, my breath grows deep. And breathing out, my breath grows slow. Breathing in, I dwell in the present moment. And breathing out, I know that this is a wonderful moment. As you inhale, I invite you to notice any places of tension in your body. You may wish to invite these places to relax. Breathe in to your shoulders, your forehead, your jaw. And as you exhale, just release any tension you may be feeling or holding. While we consciously breathe together, I wish to acknowledge some of the varied circumstances we are facing at this time. For those of us who are currently on the front lines going to work every day, we see and acknowledge you. For those of us who are home with children 24 seven, we see and we acknowledge you. For those of us who are home alone and lonely, we see you and we acknowledge you. For those of us who have lost our jobs, our income, our health insurance, we see and acknowledge you. For those of us who are afraid to go to the grocery store, we see and acknowledge you. For those of us who are quarantined in a place where you feel abused or unsafe, we see and acknowledge you. For those of us who are feeling afraid of the unknown nature of this pandemic and what the future holds, we see and we acknowledge you. For those who are sick or have loved ones who are sick, we see you. For those who are homeless or transportationless, we see you. For those who are struggling with grief, depression, mental illness, we see you. For those who are working from home while managing kids from home, we see you. For those who are mourning the loss of activities and plans, we see you. For those teachers and students trying to teach and learn online, we see you. For those who are appreciating a so lower pace of their lives and counting their blessings for that, we see you. And for those who are making masks, we see and acknowledge you. For those, everyone who is sheltering in place during this surreal time, we see and we acknowledge you. For those who are missing our families and loved ones, we see and acknowledge you. For those who are grieving the loss of loved ones, we see you. As we acknowledge the fear and the grief which may rise and fall in waves during this time, it is helpful to remain connected to our breath. This can help us stay present to whatever arises within us. As we breathe, We can allow whatever feelings to rise and fall, to come and go as they will. As we gently acknowledge them with tenderness and compassion. 
and we allow them to move through us. Moving through grief is a long process that unravels gradually in spirals and layers. It is important to trust the unfolding of our own process. May we each allow our inner wisdom to carry us through our grief in our own way, in our own time. May we remember that we are not alone. May we feel the love that surrounds us as we do the best we can every day. May we give ourselves and all those around us as much space and grace as we can. May it be so. We invited people to send us photos of the people that they love who have died in the past year. Here are those photos. Our first reading today is In Blackwater Woods by Mary Oliver. Look, the trees are turning their own bodies into pillars of light, are giving off the rich fragrance of cinnamon and fulfillment. The long tapers of cattails are bursting and floating away over the blue shoulders of the ponds. And every pond, no matter what its name is, is nameless now. Every year, everything I have ever learned in my lifetime leads back to this. The fires and the black rivers of loss whose other side is salvation, whose meaning none of us will ever know. To live in this world you must be able to do three things. 
to love what is mortal, to hold it against your bones, knowing your own life depends on it. And when the time comes to let it go, to let it go. Our second reading is Sweetness by Stephen Dunn. Just when it has seemed I couldn't bear one more friend waking with a tumor, one more maniac with a perfect reason, often a sweetness has come and changed nothing in the world except the way I stumble through it. For a while, lost in the ignorance of loving someone or something, the world shrunk to mouth size, hand size, and never seeming small. I acknowledge there is no sweetness that doesn't leave a stain, no sweetness that's ever sufficiently sweet. Tonight, a friend called to say his lover was killed in a car he was driving. His voice was low and guttural. He repeated what he needed to repeat, and I repeated the one or two words we have for such grief until we were speaking only in tones. Often a sweetness comes as if on loan, stays just long enough to make sense of what it means to be alive, then returns to its dark source. As for me, I don't care where it's been or what bitter road it's traveled to come so far to taste so good. Our third reading is Spell for Grief or Letting Go by Adrienne Marie Brown. Adequate tears twisting up directly from the heart and wrung out across the vocal cords until only a gasp remains. At least an hour a day spent staring at the truth in numb silence. A teacup of whiskey held with both hands held still under the whispers of permission from friends who can see right through, okay, and fine. An absence of theory, flight as necessary. Poetry, your own and others, on precipice, abandonment, nature and death. Courage to say what has happened, however strangling the words are, and space to not say a word. A brief dance with sugar, to honor the legacies of coping that got you this far. Sentences spoken with total pragmatism that provide clear guidance of some direction to move in, full of the tender care and balance of choice and not having to choose. Screaming why and or expressing fury at the stupid unfair fucking game of it all. This may include hours and hours, even lifetimes of lost faith. Laughter, undeniable and unpretended. A walk in the world, all that gravity with breath and heartbeat in your ears. Fire for all that can be written. Moonlight, the more full, the more nourishing. Stories, ideally of coincidence and heartache and the sweetest tiny moments. Time, more time, and then more time. Enough time to remember every moment you had with that one now taken from you, and to forget to think of it every moment. And just a glimpse of tomorrow, either in the face of an innocent or the realization of a dream. This is a non-linear spell. Cast it inside your heart, cast it between yourself and any devil, cast it into the parts of you still living. Remember you are water. Of course you leave salt trails. Of course you are crying. Flow. P.S. If there happens to be a multitude of briefs upon you, individual and collective, or fast and slow, or small and large, add equal parts of these considerations. That the broken heart can cover more territory that perhaps love can only be as large as grief demands, 
that grief is the growing up of the heart that bursts boundaries like an old skin or a finished life, that grief is gratitude, that water seeks scale, that even your tears seek the recognition of community, that the heart is a front line and the fight is to feel in a world of distraction, that death might be the only freedom, that your grief is a worthwhile use of your time, that your body will feel only as much as it is able to, that the ones you grieve may be grieving you, that the sacred comes from the limitations, that you are excellent at loving. At this time, if you so choose, I invite you to sing uh, number 101, Abide With Me. Abide with me, fast falls the eventide, the darkness deepens, still with me abide, when other helpers fail and comforts flee. Oh, abide with me. Swift to its close, at that life's little day. Earth's joys grow dim, its glories pass away. Change and decay. not abide with me. I fear no fall with thee at hand to bless. Ills have no weight and tears no bitterness. Where is death sting? What can be said in the midst of all of the griefs and losses we experience today? We remember those who died in war. We know that the death toll for COVID-19 in our country is passing 100,000 this weekend. The number of people who have fallen ill is in the millions. And there are so many other losses that surround us. About half of American households are impacted by job losses or reductions in hours and salary, and that number is likely to rise. We know that schools are closed, which is challenging for children and their families. And there are the less easy to measure, but no less real losses of this time and shelter in place. Isolation, the loss of certainty and comfort, the loss of connection, the loss of routine, the exhausting work of rethinking how to do so many small tasks in the midst of these days, from church to work to school to errands to everything. There's grief in the new vigilance we bring to all encounters and ventures beyond our doors. These are hard days. And one of the things that I know about grief and loss and coping is that much of the best support is nonverbal. It is found in a hug or quietly sitting beside someone or showing you the best 
or showing up with flowers and a casserole at someone's door, or those low tones that the poet named. And now we are reimagining all of that. We are holding Zoom memorial services and drive through car parade receiving lines and aching for the comfort of touch. I don't think the words yet exist yet to make sense of what we are going through. Perhaps they will come when the grief and loss are not so all consuming. When those of us who survive these days can look back with a little distance and find the meaning in it all. But in the meantime, I just want as many of us as possible to survive this and survive it well with our spirits and minds in relatively good shape. And so to that end, I offer the wisdom I have for living through days of loss after loss after loss while holding fast to our faith, our values, and each other. Years ago, on my way into ministry, I spent a summer working as a hospital chaplain, fulfilling a requirement for clergy of many traditions, including ours. I worked at the public hospital in Seattle, and I was assigned to offer spiritual care and emotional support to patients and families in the burn intensive care unit and the pediatric intensive care unit. It was the hardest work I have ever done. I spent my days with people having the worst days of their lives, the kind of days that most of us have nightmares about. And I offered what support I could to every, as everyone coped with the aftermath of terrible accidents. I've been thinking about those months a lot recently. As that summer spent alongside patients and families in the intensive care unit has lessons for me and I hope us as we face our present challenges. I spent so much of my time that summer feeling powerless, wishing that I could make things different for the folks I serve through the force of my will. I'm feeling that a lot right now too but that's not how it works. All I could offer were the modest tools I had. Prayer and scripture for some, deep listening for others, theological support for the few who are ready to try to make meaning out of the horrible things that had just happened, and reminders to look out the window. The public hospital in Seattle is called Harborview. And fitting such a name, it has beautiful views. Views of Elliott Bay and Puget Sound and the Olympic Mountains to the west, as well as views of the Cascade Mountains in the other directions. The intensive care units are on the very top floor of the hospital, and the views are spectacular. And those views were the secret tool of the spiritual care department. When things were really hard, when there were no adequate words for what we were dealing with. We would all find ourselves looking out the windows. The sound and the mountains brought some comfort. We found ourselves slowing our breaths. We all remembered that there was a world beyond that hospital room. I spent so much time looking out those windows that summer, both with the people I served and by myself as I sought not to hold the pain that I witnessed so tightly. And those views didn't fix anything really. Watching a ferry boat slowly cross Puget Sound didn't heal anyone's body. Looking at Mount Rainier looming on the horizon didn't mend broken bones or, or burned flesh. But that beauty did make the burdens of the world a little easier to carry. It changed nothing in the world except the way that we stumble through it. And that is no small thing. So people search people have heard me say this many times in these months. 
go outside every day. Find something beautiful every day. It doesn't have to be postcard worthy. A dandelion patch, a redbud tree, a cardinal. The simple, beautiful things all count. And while we as a people, as Unitarian Universalists, seem to find a lot of our beauty in the natural world, we know that is not the only source. Listen to your favorite music, look at visual art or create it, study the face of someone you love, memorize a poem that you love. We need beauty and we need sweetness now, perhaps more than ever. The reason why I keep returning to the importance of beauty right now is that we are all in danger of going numb. The griefs and losses that surround us are overwhelming. And while it is tempting to shut off our feelings to power through, that is not a long-term survival strategy. Psychotherapist Francis Weller has said, everything I love, I will lose. That's the harsh truth. You either have to shut down your heart and miss the love that is around you or wrestle that truth and come out the other end. He continues, the work of the mature person is to carry grief in one hand and gratitude in the other and to be stretched large by them. How much sorrow can I hold? That's how much gratitude I can give. If I carry only grief, I'll bend toward cynicism and despair. If I have only gratitude, I'll become saccharine and won't develop compassion for other people's suffering. Grief keeps the heart fluid and soft, which helps make compassion possible. So the work of these days is staying present to all of it, the beauty, the pain, the love and the loss, and staying soft-hearted in the midst of a world that breaks our hearts over and over and over again. As the author, doula facilitator and activist, Adrienne Marie Brown reminded us in that reading today, the broken heart can cover more territory. And she names that grief is a reminder that we are excellent at loving. So that is wisdom that I am holding close these days as our hearts break with the losses around us. May our pain and discomfort and grief lead us to even more compassion. I invite you all to seek beauty and sweetness as you grieve. Grieving those who died in war on this Memorial Day weekend, grieving our beloved dead whose pictures we just saw, Grieving others who died from illness and death, who died from illness. Grief is hard, slow work. Be extravagantly gentle with yourself and those you love. I have another piece of wisdom from my time in the intensive care units to offer. The chaplain interns spent a lot of time learning about grief. And as a, as a dark joke, one of my fellow interns created a poster in our office wherein she encouraged us to list the smallest griefs we had ever experienced, perhaps as a way to balance out the overwhelming griefs we witnessed each day. And so over the weeks, the list grew. The favorite stuffed animal we lost as a child, when a favorite restaurant closed, the favorite pair of pants that ripped beyond repair, being 12 and watching gymnastics on TV and realizing that we were too old to start training now to become an elite gymnast. The first time we ever felt too old to do something. What started as a joke became profound because we never get a chance to grieve or usually even to name those smaller losses that pile up across a lifetime. 
and that are coming in such a rush right now in the midst of shutdown and stay at home. So I give you the optional homework of making your own poster with the smaller griefs and losses that are part of these days. They might include feeling left behind with all our reliance on technology, working in conditions that are challenging or maybe even unsafe, canceled plans, not being able to go to the places that we love, not being able to do things that were once routine without an elaborate calculation of risk, existing in a world that feels so uncertain, not being able to make plans or look ahead with any certainty about what life looks like in two months or six months or a year, being afraid of other people's breath. We know that alongside the 100,000 dead in our country and the millions who've gotten sick and might have complications that last their whole lives, these sorts of griefs are small. That doesn't mean they're not real. We can hold, we don't need to get in some sort of hierarchy of grief and who is allowed to feel what, because we need moments for all of it. So I encourage you to find ways to honor and name all of the griefs from the mon monumental to the minuscule that you're carrying right now. Write them down, share them with someone you trust who has the capacity to hear them. That capacity piece is important. Don't bring your small things to people who are dealing with their beloved's death. Light a candle. Know that all griefs are a burden, especially when they come one after another, as they are right now for so many of us. So naming our griefs and our losses and giving us space to feel the feelings that we're having keeps us soft-hearted. And we need to be soft-hearted now, full of grief, capable of gratitude, and excellent at loving to endure these days and be the people that we are meant to be. So on this Memorial Day weekend, may we grieve the losses, all of them, monumental and minuscule, that touch our lives and break our hearts. May we find the beauty and the sweetness that changes nothing in the world except how we stumble through it, and knowing that how we stumble through it is vitally important. And may we know that our losses and griefs contain within them the reminder that we are excellent at loving. So my people, be extravagantly gentle with yourself and with each other in these days. May it be so, may we make it so, and amen. So it is our tradition at People's Church on this weekend, this Memorial Day weekend, to invite people to come forward and light candles. And now with our gathering spread across Michigan and beyond, we are adapting this ritual. So I am going to do the actual lighting of candles. We have a, a candle cam set up in another corner of my living room. And I'm going to unmute everyone and invite you to name your losses and griefs as you feel so moved. It will be cacophony and it will be chaos. And that is what I need right now. Perhaps that's a need for you too. We have been so isolated. And I think the overwhelming noise of, of hundreds of us naming losses could be comforting in a strange way. A reminder that none of us are alone in our experiences right now. So I am unmuting us. This is an experiment. We will see what happens. <laughs> Two, 
my brother Raj. Meeting with friends and my travel plans. I wanted to see my sister in Florida. I missed our travel plans. See my brother and his wife, my sister and her husband. Our granddaughter's graduations. Oh, boy. I love you, Julie and Brian. <laughs> love you, Whoever Jay. that was, we love you. Oh, that's it's Brian. Brian. Missy Ryan. <laughs> Sorry about Charlie. Uh, Sally Padley. Maybe Charlie about Charlie. Oh, yes. Sally Padley. Please talk. No, I Thank you, everybody. That cacophony was, was powerful for me. I hope it spoke to you as well. We are now going to close in song. Our closing song is There is Love. Um, I've pre prepared a little bit of harmony for you. Uh, your job is to just sing the melody and it goes like this. 
There is a love holding us. There is a love holding all that we love. There is a love holding all. We rest in this love. Here we go. everyone on this day may we grieve may we feel all of the griefs of this day without having to argue with ourselves about whether we're allowed to feel them or not because of how they compare to someone else's may we seek beauty and sweetness and may we be grateful for what we have and hold that grief and that gratitude and be stretched so our hearts break to cover the whole world. So let us go in peace and go in love. And if you would like to stay for coffee hour, linger through the postlude. If you are done, this is your invitation to, to leave the meeting. It was good to be with you today. <laughs>